In Their Finest Hour, the second volume of his memoir, The Second World War, Winston Churchill wrote, The only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. From the moment war was declared, the German Navy, or Kriegsmarine, waged a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare against Britain and allied shipping in the Atlantic. Being a small island nation, Britain was dependent on foreign imports for nearly 70% of its food, and the campaign was intended to starve the British into submission and bring them to the negotiating table. The ensuing naval struggle, known as the Battle of the Atlantic, would be the single longest continuous campaign of the Second World War. At the start of the war, the Royal Navy was ill-equipped to deal with the U-boat menace, having relatively few destroyers and aircraft carriers with which to escort and protect merchant shipping. Weapons and tactics were also largely inadequate, with most U-boats being able to dive and slip away long before any attack could be brought to bear. Furthermore, the limited range of Allied aircraft resulted in a vast 600-kilometer-wide area of Greenland known as the Mid-Atlantic Gap, or the Black Gap, over which air cover could not be provided. To get around these limitations, the Admiralty resurrected the World War I-era convoy system, gathering merchant ships into groups of around 30 to 70 before shepherding them across the Atlantic. While at first glance this practice might seem like it would just create a juicier target for the U-boats, there was a method to the madness. In the pre-convoy system, when each ship had to plot its own independent course across the Atlantic, the chances of a given U-boat randomly stumbling across a ship were relatively high. In the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean, however, even a convoy of 70 ships presented a target not much larger than a single ship, making them harder to find. Plus, grouping ships together made it much easier for a small number of escort vessels to protect the convoy. The system proved surprisingly effective, with less than 30% of the some 2,700 Allied ships sunk by U-boats during the war being torpedoed while in convoy. Yet despite this, the situation for the British was about to become even worse. With the capitulation of France in June of 1940, the Kriegsmarine gains access to ports along the Atlantic coast, meaning that U-boats no longer had to make the long voyage from bases on Germany's Baltic coast through the North Sea and into the Atlantic. Sailing from fortified bases at Brest, Lorient, La Rochelle between July and October 1940, the U-boats launched a renewed offensive in which they sunk nearly 1.5 million tons of Allied shipping, a period that would become known to U-boat crews as the happy time. And as if this wasn't enough, the fall of France also brought with it a brand new menace, this time from the air. Originally designed as an airliner for Lufthansa, the Fokker Wolf FW200 Condor was adopted by the Luftwaffe in 1938 as a long-range transport and maritime patrol aircraft. Operating from bordeaux Marignac Airport on the coast of France, Condors could fly up to 3,500 kilometers out over the Atlantic to track down Allied convoys, which they would then either radio in to waiting U-boats or attack directly with up to 1,000 kilograms of bombs. Due to the lack of heavy anti-aircraft guns on the merchantmen and their escorts, the Condors could attack with impunity, and between June 1940 and February 1941, they sank an estimated half million tons of Allied shipping, leading Winston Churchill to dub the aircraft the Scourge of the Atlantic. The Admiralty scrambled to find a suitable countermeasure to this new threat. Eventually, two methods were proposed by Captain M. S. Slattery of the Royal Navy. The fitting of the simplest possible flight decks and landing equipment, or the fitting of catapults to suitable merchant ships. The first of these, the fitting of flight decks to merchant ships to form makeshift escort carriers, was the preferred option, but would take some time to implement. Unable to wait as a stopgap measure, the Admiralty approved the development of catapult aircraft merchantmen, or CAM ships, one of the strangest naval weapons of the Second World War. CAM ships consisted of a merchant vessel with a 23-meter-long rocket-powered catapult fitted to their bows on which was carried a single Hawker Hurricane fighter, affectionately known as a Hurricat. Otherwise unarmed cam ships would operate as ordinary merchantmen, with one or two being assigned to each convoy. Pilots were drawn from the Royal Air Force and formed into the Merchant Service Fighter Unit, or MSFU, under the command of Wing Commander E.S. Malton Barrett at RF Spec, Liverpool. MSFU pilots signed on as civilian members of the ship's crews under the direct authority of the ship's master, with each vessel's chief engineer and first mate being placed in charge of catapult operations. When an enemy aircraft was spotted, a pilot would climb into the hurricane and rocket off the catapult to either shoot it down or chase it away. The Condor was a slow and cumbersome aircraft, making it easy prey. But as you might have already realized, with his mission now complete, the pilot now faced a rather grim prospect. With no land around for thousands of miles and no aircraft carriers in the convoy, his only means of returning home would be to bail out or ditch in the ocean and wait to be picked up by a member of the convoy. The waters of the North Atlantic, being only a few 
few degrees above freezing, well, time was of the essence. And if the convoy then came under attack by U-boats or more aircraft, the pilot's chances of survival were next to nil. The camships truly were a weapon of desperation. Nonetheless, by May 1941, 35 merchant vessels had been converted to camships and assigned to Atlantic and Arctic convoy duty. In addition, five older naval vessels were converted into dedicated fighter catapult ships crewed by Royal Navy personnel. These were the ocean boarding vessels Maplin, Araguani, and Patia, the anti-aircraft cruiser Springbank and the seaplane carrier Pegasus. However, early reports from these vessels were less than encouraging, with the fragile aircraft taking a beating at the hands of the harsh North Atlantic weather. Covers were ripped off airframe, corroded engine mags, and all electrical gear setting up current. In bad weather, inspection and maintenance was impossible, and corrosion was an ever-present problem. And despite being dedicated naval vessels with professional crews, the fighter catapult ships proved alarmingly short-lived, with Patia being bombed and sunk in April, Araguania and Springbank torpedoed in September, and the aging Pegasus retired in April 1942 and used as a catapult training ship. But on August 3, 1941, the remaining vessel, HMS Maplin, became the first fighter catapult ship to successfully engage an enemy aircraft. While steaming to rendezvous with the convoy, the Maplin spotted a single Condor approaching and launched its hurricane, piloted by Lieutenant R. W. H. Everett of the Royal Navy Reserve. The engagement was swift and decisive, as Everett later recalled, I had reached the starboard bow and three machine guns opened up, as well as the forward cannon. I did a quick turn to port and opened up just abaft the beam. I fired five second burst at this range and my guns were empty. The Condor burst into flames and spiraled into the water, whereupon Everett managed to ditch his aircraft near the convoy and was soon picked up by a boat from the destroyer HMS Wanderer. He was later awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his actions. The first combat action for a civilian camship took place on November the 1st, when the Empire Foam spotted a Condor off the west coast of Ireland. However, the aircraft immediately fled upon spotting the flash of the Hurricane being launched. The first real combat test of the CAM system would not come until May 1942. On the 15th of May, convoy PQ-16, escorted by the CAM ship Empire Lawrence, set sail from Iceland bound for Russia, while simultaneously convoy QP-12, escorted by Empire Morn, departed from Murmansk. On May the 25th, as the two convoys approached one another, the Empire Lawrence spotted an approaching formation of four German aircraft, two Condors, and two Junkers Ju-88 bombers. However, the weather was too foggy for the Empire Lawrence to launch its own aircraft, so it fell to the Empire Morn to defend the convoy. At 8.55 in the morning, pilot officer J.B. Kendall rocketed into the air and pressed home his attack. While he managed to shoot down one of the Condors, his own aircraft was badly damaged in the attack, and as a later Royal Navy report stated, some seconds later the Hurricane was seen to dive perpendicularly into the sea, followed immediately by Kendall, his parachute opening some 50 feet before he reached the water. The destroyer HMS Badsworth rushed to the scene and fished Kendall out of the water, but he was found to be badly wounded and died of his injuries shortly thereafter. Meanwhile, a new formation of Heinkel HE-111 bombers had appeared, forcing pilot officer Alistair Hay aboard the Empire Lawrence to rocket into action. Hay succeeded in shooting down one Heinkel and damaging another before being wounded by a cannon shell and forced to bail out. His inflatable dinghy was punctured by shrapnel, but he was picked up by the destroyer HMS Volunteer before he could succumb to hypothermia. It was later determined that the cannon shell that had wounded him had been fired not by the Germans, but an anti-aircraft gunner aboard one of the ships. The enemy bombers sunk five merchant ships, among them the Empire Lawrence. Hurricane pilots would score three more victories in 1942, with one even managing to save his aircraft in the process. On September the 18th, off the coast of Russia, flying officer A.H. Burr took off from the Empire Morn and attacked a formation of HE-111s, shooting down one before running out of ammunition. Determined to protect the convoy at all costs, Burr then looped around and dove on the formation in a series of unarmed dummy attacks, finally managing to drive them away. Then, less than enthusiastic about the prospect of ditching, he turned towards shore and landed in Archangel with only five gallons of fuel left in his tank. By mid-1943, the need for cam ships had come to an end, as more and more dedicated escort carriers became available and long-range patrol aircraft like the American B-24 Liberator finally closed the Mid-Atlantic Gap, allowing convoys to be protected over their entire crossing. On June the 8th, the MSFU was officially disbanded, but not before enjoying one final moment of glory. After German military intelligence learned of the disbandment, on July the 28th, the Luftwaffe sent a flight of Condors to Gibraltar to attack a seemingly undefended convoy. 
However, among the vessels were the cam ships Empire Darwin and Empire Tide, who were returning to the British Isles to have their catapults removed. On spotting the aircraft, Flying Officer J.A. Stewart and Flying Officer P.J.R. Flynn launched into action, managing to shoot down one Condor and scatter the rest. In the end, the 35 cam ships and five FCS ships converted during the war scored a total of six aircraft shot down and three damaged at a cost of 12 ships lost in action. While these numbers may seem minuscule, the main contribution of the cam ships was psychological, with their mere presence discouraging German aircraft from pressing home their attacks. Within months of the ship's appearance, long-range attacks by Condors dropped to nearly zero. While a crude and dangerous stopgap solution, cam ships and Hurricats were instrumental to keeping Britain's vital supply lines open and a testament to British ingenuity, the desperation of the early war years, and the bravery of the pilots who volunteered to fly what they must have known were virtual suicide missions in some cases. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.